All right. Hey, morning, guys. My audio is okay. Everyone's on mute, so. <laughs> yes, your audio is oh, great. Well, big cheese chimes in. Okay, good. The All visual, right. I'm not sure about, but the yeah, audio is no. great. What am I going to do? It's what God gave me. All right, let's get going. Got a lot to blabber about. So we're going to talk about carotid surgery today. We're going to um, spend most of the time talking about endarterectomy, but um, also touch in on the stenting piece. Going to go over, you know, what I do to get ready for this case, um, and then I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on the regional piece, and then some of the relevant uh, written exam question type uh, scenarios. So, who gets surgery? Who gets an endarterectomy? Now, um, the volume has dropped considerably over the years, um, especially since I was a resident. You know, '05 to '08, we used to do several a month, and I feel like the volume is much less. And I think a big piece of that is. Uh, the best medical therapy has really improved. You know, so there's lots of work done, lots of studies over the years, um, starting in the 80s and pushing through. And, you know, basically it's looking at what's the risk of stroke with atherosclerotic carotid disease with and without surgery. And what's been tricky is the best medical therapy has changed over time. I'm gonna have a slide discussing what best medical therapy is, but it's probably pretty efficacious now. And so this data from the past is not necessarily perfect because they didn't have those real potent statins back then. We really didn't have um, the knowledge that we do now in preventing progression of the disease. So we'll take that with a grain of salt. And what you'll see is that there's gonna be a fair amount of variability in who comes for surgery. So basically, um, we have asymptomatic and we have symptomatic carotid disease. So asymptomatic would be where primary care doc does an ultrasound, finds 60% disease, patient has no symptoms. Where do we go from there? Do they get surgery? And then we have symptomatic disease. Maybe somebody presents with aphasia, dysarthria, um, gait problems, maybe they have a scan and they see a, a large uh, or a small uh, infarct. So we have asymptomatic versus symptomatic. And so let's touch on asymptomatic first. Now, really getting into the nitty gritty of who gets surgery is out of the scope of this lecture, but I wanna discuss it. So when you see a patient, you can help decide if they're um, been placed correctly. So if you have asymptomatic disease, less than 50%, you're not getting surgery, right? So no symptoms, less than 50%, no surgery. You are gonna get best medical therapy though. And I'll get into that in a second. Now we talk about levels of evidence and grades of literature. Um, you know, that obviously 1A, you know, we got randomized prospective trials that have shown benefit. Um, you're not going to see that with the asymptomatic disease. You're going to see 2B, 2C. And so basically what's going to happen is if there's 80% or more with asymptomatic disease, they're probably going to get recommended surgery. But from 50 to 80, it's a little bit wish-washy and it can go either way. So we have uh, less than 50, no surgery, 50 to 80, depending on the patient's uh, long-term outlook. And, you know, the long-term outlook has to do with, you know, when you have carotid disease, you have about a half to 1% risk of stroke per year. So if your life expectancy is only a year or two, you may not get the benefit. Let me just call. Everybody could just mute up. I should probably just mute everybody. Um, so, you know, when you have your surgery, the day of surgery, you're going to have some increased perioperative risk. In that perioperative period, you're going to have perioperative risk. So does that risk, is that less than the risk of you having a stroke over the next five or six years? That's what you want to decide as far as do they proceed to surgery. So if their life expectancy is only a year or two, then maybe it doesn't make sense to take that anywhere from less than 3% to 5% to 7% perioperative risk. All right, so that's the asymptomatic piece. 
You guys can bear with me. I'm just going to figure out how to meet everybody. Aha, I mute all. Love it. All right, done. All right, so as we talked about, the, um, the benefit of best medical therapy hasn't been well established in the literature because it's changed over time. But patients undergoing endarterectomy, they want to have aspirin perioperatively and postoperatively unless contraindicated. And there are some times when asymptomatic patients with lower disease might be suggested for surgery. And those are ones that maybe they saw silent infarction on CAT scan. Uh, maybe there was stenosis progression. So a lot of these patients, if they have 50, 60%, they'll have an ultrasound, a duplex every six months. And if there's stenosis progression, maybe they'll then get recommended for surgery rather than a regression. And then there's other more complicated factors that are looked at like large plaque area, echo lucency of the plaque, intraplaque hemorrhage on MRI, impaired cerebral vasoreactivity, spontaneous embolization on transcranial, transcranial Doppler. Um, and so those are factors that may have someone eventually get recommended for surgery. So what is BMT, best medical therapy, intensive medical therapy? It's a statin. It's uh, usually aspirin, sometimes Plavix, depending. It's getting your hypertension to gold to prevent further endothelial dysfunction. It's getting glycemic control. It's quitting smoking. It's losing weight. It's getting active. Now, when it comes to carotid artery stenting, a lot of work's been done over the years, uh, Sapphire trial, Crest trial. And what's been tricky here is um, the operator dependent variability. So if you're at a center that does 50 a year, you're at a much lower risk than at a center that does five or 10 a year. And so the perioperative risk, periprocedural risk of carotid artery stenting really depends on the operator. And the initial trials really were pushing for this when you were not a good surgical candidate. And then a lot of data ended up showing that the younger cohort actually had less periprocedural stroke risk. But what's done here is a wire goes uh, transfemorally, goes to the lesion. There's usually a device after the, um, stent that will collect uh, embolic, embolic debris and a stent will be deployed in the carotid. But who gets this is really up for debate. And you know, unfortunately we're in um, a capitalistic profit driven healthcare system where you get paid for your procedures. So you always have to be on the lookout is, is this the right procedure for the right patient? All right, now for symptomatic patients, um, again, there's different guidelines. There's European guidelines, there's US guidelines, there's AHA guidelines, there's the, the vascular surgery um, organization's guidelines, but they recommend carotid and arterectomy for patients with severe 70 to 99%. Now, when you see 100% carotid, there's no indication for an intervention there, just to point that out. Um, and that would be class one level of evidence A. So symptomatic disease, patient came in with TIA or a rind, right? A rind is like less than 24 hour TIA type symptoms. Um, and they have high grade disease, that's class 1A, right? Good, that's the data we like to see. Um, but if it's a little less severe, maybe 50 to 69, it level of evidence B, which is still um, you know, not showing harm and there's, there's decent data there. Um, but you have to also meet other criteria, which is that the surgeon feels that the, um, the lesion is accessible surgically. Um, and you know that brings up intracranial versus extracranial disease. If there's a lot of intracranial disease, like at the circle of Willis, then maybe it doesn't make sense to fix what's at the bifurcation. Um, and then you want to look at the patient's perioperative risk because really perioperative MI, there's a lot of risk around this surgery. And you want to make sure that that risk of that doesn't outweigh, is not higher than the risk um, of the procedure. 
All right, so to review, asymptomatic, less than 50, best medical therapy. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be greater than 80 is probably going to get recommended, asymptomatic greater than 80%, but you'll also see anywhere in between the 50 to 80 get recommended based on the plaque lesion. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, here's a picture from Jaffe. So Jaffe is a book that takes every procedure we do, and it basically says, you know, here are the key points about it. Here's positioning. Here's the type of blood loss you'll have. Here are some nitty gritty about, you know, what to expect as far as duration and complications. And, you know, in my opinion, if you're a resident in anesthesia, you should have this book. <laughs> it's a pretty strong endorsement. So um, looks like this, the anesthesiologist manual of surgical procedures by Jaffe. And so basically it takes each procedure and breaks it down. All right, so um, the picture A here shows that following the occlusion of superior thyroid and internal and external and common carotid arteries, an arteriotomy is performed opposite the external carotid takeoff. And then picture B shows a shunt, right? So what is a shunt? A shunt allows blood to go from the heart that's coming up the phenomenon and out the carotid, it allows it to go past where you've occluded the arteries. And so the surgeon will dissect down to the vessel, clamp it off, open it up, and usually place a shunt at that time. Now, if the patient has good contralateral circulation, it will come to the side of the brain that is affected by the clamping and the patient may not have any symptoms. But if the patient's under general anesthesia and you cannot assess whether or not they're having cerebral vascular insufficiency, then a shunt will usually prophylactically be placed. But it can be opted to not do a shunt if the patient's awake and doing well and there's no sign of insufficiency. And then the picture C here is showing the plaque is separated from the artery wall, it's removed, and then usually there's a patch put on, or um, uh, sometimes there's another technique to widen the vessel. All right, so let's talk about like how I approach this, right? So you want a really good IV. You want a, a free flowing IV, you wanna make sure it's not infiltrating. You know, remember you might be using vasopressors and you don't wanna risk um, an arm that's tucked out of your site infiltrating with phenylephrine or, or norepinephrine. So you want this IV in the opposite side of the surgery. All right, so you wanna see that arm. You don't want your good IV in the arm that's tucked. So this is one of the few cases where I look for an AC IV. I want an antecubital IV because I want something that's going to be able to uh, volume resuscitate, give vasopressors in the short term, but also I can see and keep an eye on. And the reason I like AC is there's big veins there and it leaves your arterial line area wide open. So think about it, you know, look at the consent, see what side they're working on. And on the opposite side, put your large bore IV and then, you know, run 500 cc's in before you get in the room, make sure that it's not infiltrating. Now, I also like to put a HEP lock in the opposite side, in the surgical side, I like to put a HEP lock in the hand. And instead of making a U where it's tucked and you can't see it, I'll just have it hanging towards the knuckles. That way, if my IV becomes an issue on the operative side, I can go under the drape and hook up to my backup IV. Now I've read a couple case reports where during surgery, the patient reached up and put their hand in the open wound. Not good, not something you ever wanna be a part of. So I like to put a soft wrist restraint on the surgical arm, right? And these are nice and padded. They have them in the ORs and the Omni cells. And you tie that to the bed rail. That way, if the patient were to get agitated or whatever, they can't reach in and put their hand in the wound. So on the surgical side, we want a wrist restraint and a hep lock in the hand. And then we want the arms tucked and use the good foam. Use those long foams that cover the elbow, the ulnar groove, 
and the long ones are good because they keep their wrist from flopping down. So say, hey, listen, I know they're usually for the robots, but can you get me the good arm crate? So you want a nice tuck, you want a heflock there, you want your wrist restraint on the operative side. Now I like to have a pillow under the knees because there's some data that if you put a pillow under the knees that you, you unload the lumbar back, you know, you, the, the strain on the low back. And anything you can do to have your patient be more comfortable is gonna allow them to lie there still for these 90 minutes. If their back's hurting, it may cause them to get antsy and make your life harder. So put a pillow under the knees. Uh, I like to put the bear hugger blanket on, but I usually don't turn it on because remember, we have the potential for cerebral ischemia and CMRO2 goes up by 8% per degree. And there's, I don't really like them to be too warm for this case, but you also don't want them cold because if they shiver, as you know, shivering uses your muscles and then your myocardial oxygen consumption can go up by 800%. So if someone has a tight left main, just shivering in a pack, you can lead to an MI. So we don't want them cold, but we don't want them hot either. So I'll put the blanket there and I'll turn it on if the case is getting long, but usually they're pretty wrapped up. That is not usually an issue. Now, fire risk. Anytime you have surgery above the xiphoid process and you have a oxygen source and you have a ignition source, you're gonna have an elevated fire risk. So what do you do? You make sure everyone's aware. You make sure there's no cautery used before the uh, prep dries, especially if it's alcohol-based prep. You make sure there's water on the back table. So if there's ever a fire, it can be doused. And then you wanna make sure you, you make precautions around your oxygen source. So if it's an eye case and you have a nasal cannula, you want that oxygen off. In the carotid, you, you may make sure you have a, you know, a low flow. You make sure that there's a good seal of the drape. Um, and you may make a decision to have it on or off, but you always wanna be cognizant of this fire risk. And maybe you'll consider a face mask because when you're mouth breathing, you may lose your end title at the nose. So sometimes a simple face mask with an angiocatheter in it to sample is your best bet. And that bottom right picture shows the ether screen. So you can use a Mayo or an ether screen to keep the drape off the patient's face. And we have these around the OR and you wanna have a ball for the patient to squeeze so you can watch, um, you know, because the opposite hand is controlled by the cerebral hemisphere of the, of the surgical side. So you want them to be able to squeeze the ball and also tell you they're okay. So how, what are you assessing? You're assessing their motor function by saying squeeze the ball and you ask them, how are you? And you tell them you don't want them to nod yes, right? Because nodding yes during carotid surgery is not the best thing. So you tell them in advance, hey, listen, I'm gonna keep an eye on how your brain is working. So I'm gonna have you squeeze the ball. And when I ask you how you are, I just want you to say, good. That way, right before they clamp, you get a baseline. Then the surgeon clamps and you ask again. And if there's a change, that shunt has to get in there. And once the shunt is in, if they still can't function, they may the surgeon may have to either unclamp, the surgeon may have, you may have to uh, secure the airway, you may have to drive up the blood pressure. Um, and so that's what we're doing we're, by um, monitoring this cognitive function. Now, you wanna be smooth, you want a smooth case. So what can you do to improve the efficiency? One is to already have the bed turned when you come in the room, right? So you're there this time in the morning, you turn the bed, and you lock it in position. Now make sure you do it the right turn because you can easily set a team up for wrong-sided surgery if you turn it the wrong way. So make sure you know what side you're doing and turn the bed. And it's one less thing once the patient's in and they're on the bed, then you have to turn it. It's one less step for you to help make the room more efficient. So have the bed already turned in. If you can, get that A-line out there in recovery because that's gonna save you five, 10 minutes when the surgeon's hovering over you and you really wanna be focusing on the nerve block um, if that A-line is already in, it'll help just make it more efficient. Remember the OR costs, because there's environmental services, there's nurses, there's techs, there's surgeons, there's anesthesiologists, it's about $60 a minute. So if you're wasting 10, 15 minutes to get the A-line, that's a fair amount of money. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about if you do this case um, under regional block with sedation, you know, what is your sedation going to be? Well, we have two great agents for this. 
But remember on your oral boards, you want to say, I would use small titratable doses of reversible anesthetics, right? Um, a short acting or reversible anesthetic. So that means that you want to titrate some benzodiazepine, some narcotic, those are reversible and short acting drugs like dexmedetomidine or propofol um, are options. But so when I choose between remifentanil and dexmedetomidine, I choose remifentanil because the safest anesthetic is the one you're most comfortable with. So I like uh, uh, remifentanil because over the years I've gotten very comfortable with it. So how do I use remifentanil? You wanna put it for this kind of case in a 250 bag. And the reason is you want the volume from the pump to be going in the patient at a high rate. So if someone were to close the IV, it doesn't all collect in the tubing. Then you open the IV, patient gets a bolus and becomes apneic. So I personally like to put two and 250. Then I'll start it at 0.05 mics per kilo per minute, right? So remifentanil on a pump, 0.05 mics per kilo per minute. And then I'll go up by 0.025 mics per kilo per minute every couple of minutes until I see that respiratory rate come down to um, eight or 10. At the same time, I'll titrate some midazolam. Now I want to keep the patient from getting disassociated. So I'll use small titratable doses. Remember the brain equilibration time for midazolam is 5.4 minutes. So you don't want to stack your doses. You want to make sure that it has kicked in and you like where they're going. And what I like them to be is I like a glabellar tap. So their eyes are closed. I tap their forehead and the eyes open. That's where I want them to be. So you have jaw thrust, you have different assessments of how advanced your sedation is, but a, a glabellar tap with eye opening is where my endpoint is for my benzodiazepine with this case. And my endpoint for the remifentanil is a respiratory rate of eight to 10. For a wake fiber optic, I'll shoot more for six. But um, my goal is when the surgeon has retraction, then no matter how good my block is, they start to get some being maybe a little uncomfortable. I wanna make sure that's uh, minimized by having a good amount of narcotic on board. Now, whenever you change your remifentanil dose, look at the infusion rate, make sure it makes sense. You know, I had a resident once, great resident, did wonderful work, but <laughs> the case was going wonderful. We were three quarters of the way through and I came in and he was bagging the patient under the drape. And uh, I said, what happened? He said, I'm not sure. And, but what happened was he changed the remifentanil dose by an order of magnitude accidentally. And if you looked at the pump, it was 999, right? And so if the rate is 999, you know you made a mistake. So whenever you change your pump, look at the rate and make sure it doesn't, that it makes sense for what's in that bag prior to hitting confirm. All right, and remember to do a timeout before your block because wrong-sided block is pretty easy to do. And I've seen it happen twice and uh, it is unacceptable. It's a never event, it should not happen. So make sure you do a timeout. What's a timeout? It's a patient name and another identifier. So either birth date and MR, you don't need five things. You just need a name and a second identifier, whether it be MR or birth date in the side. And that has to do, someone has to be looking at the bracelet right? And say, okay, this is this patient, this is their birth date. The other person's looking at the consent form and the side's marked and you, and you make sure that everybody agrees. Um, never want to do a wrong-sided anything. So um, just always drop what you're doing when the timeout's happening. Um, so why do we do an A-line? Remember on your oral boards, we do an arterial line for beat-to-beat -beat variability. You know, the oral examiner says, why are you doing an A-line? Because it's a big case. Nope, that's not what you want to say. You want to say, I want beat to beat variability. So I can also do frequent blood gas assessments. I can evaluate stroke volume variability. I can um, check hemoglobins frequently. And this will allow me to manage my, uh, my mean arterial blood pressure. Because remember, um, cerebral blood flow is your mean arterial pressure minus your, your CVP or your ICP, whichever is higher. And so your MAP is really important in this case because when we're clamped, we want our mean arterial pressure probably 20% greater than baseline. And it usually happens automatically. 
the body does it, which is amazing. Um, but the, the arterial line allows that rapid assessment. Remember with the carotid, we're gonna do heparin, right? And so during the uh, carotid and arterectomy, you're gonna give heparin, it's usually 80 per kilo. And so you wanna have in your brain what the dose is in your head prior to the case. So you make sure it makes sense when the surgeon asks for 5,000 or 7,500, you say, well, what, you know, their body weight is 45 kilos. You know, you, you wanna talk about this prior to giving it. Um, and you wanna shoot for an ACT at 200 to 250. Now, because it's a short case and because um, you're not going on pump, you don't have to do ACT, but it's good practice. And if you have it at your facility, I would do it. And then usually reverse heparin after end arterectomy, but you don't usually reverse heparin after a stenting, but it's usually up to the proceduralist. All right, so regional versus general. Well, it's been hard to study, but um, you guys all know when you do a general anesthetic, you can have post-induction hypotension, you can have hypertension after intubation, you have max, you have waxing and waning of your blood pressure throughout the case. Um, in my opinion, it's more physiologic to try to avoid all of that and to do a regional technique, but the data has panned out I think it was called the Gala trial, a pretty big trial showed there was no difference in general versus regional in multiple, multiple endpoints. So it's reasonable for you to do one or the other. You don't have to feel guilty. Oh, I did a, a, a general today on a carotid and I'm a bad anesthesiologist. No, it's evidence-based and it's reasonable to do that. If I was having the procedure on myself, I would prefer regional so they can watch my brain function throughout and make decisions on blood pressure based on that, et cetera. But um, if you have a patient who's not gonna tolerate losing their phrenic, right? Your phrenic gives 35% of your tidal volume through diaphragmatic function. So if you meet a patient with a big fat round belly or a patient who's using their accessory respiratory muscles to breathe at rest, lying them flat on their block back and blocking their phrenic, which you will do with this block, is not going to lead to a, a calm, steady patient for 90 minutes. So you might just want to do a general on that patient from the start. Or if your surgeon tells you it's a very high up lesion, you might want to do a general. Or if you have a surgeon who's going to take six hours for a 90 minute case, you might want to do a general. So you, you take that all into account. Is your patient cooperative? If that patient's cooperative, normal body habitus, I would proceed with a regional. Um, by the way, there was one meta-analysis and it was non-randomized, which means there's probably selection bias that uh, showed the 50% reduction in the risk of stroke, death, MI, pulmonary complications, and length of hospital stay when you did a regional. So there's probably some evidence out there that regional has an advantage, but remember, it's about patient selection. All right, so let's get into the actual block. Here is your cervical plexus, right? Your sternocleidomastoid from your mastoid to the sternum. Underneath there is where your cervical plexus comes out. We have the greater auricular nerve. So if you're doing a suture on the earlobe, we have the lesser occipital nerve back here where my hand is. We have the transverse cervical artery, uh, I'm sorry, uh, nerve, which is um, gonna get like the parathyroid, thyroid area. And we have our supraclavicular, which is gonna get the supraclavicular fossa and also the osteotomes to the clavicle. So this block can cover laceration repairs. It can cover central lines. It can cover bilateral OV, the parathyroid thyroid surgery, um, clavicle surgery, the medial two thirds is supraclavicular. The lateral one third is brachial plexus. So you do interscalene and a superficial cervical plexus, intermediate cervical plexus block. But this confluence of nerves comes from C234 and it comes through the prevertebral fascia and it pops out under the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And so we're gonna put our needle right where that red circle is and we're gonna put 10 to 20 mLs and we're gonna be done. It's that easy. You can see the EJ crosses around this point and it's about the level of C6. It's another look at like 
I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here's the ansa cervicalis. This gives all your motor nerves to the strap muscles. And the C234, they come out and they form the supraclavicular, lesser occipital, greater auricular, and transverse cervical. All right, now, when you do this block, you can be a technician. You can put in, you can feel a pop, put some local and be done and not really understand. But if you wanna be a doctor, you wanna understand what could go wrong you want to know the anatomy, the nitty gritty, so you can recognize what's going on and explain to people what's happening. And that's what this lecture is about. I could teach you this block in two minutes, or I can really get into the anatomy behind it. And the difference is that you'll be able to understand anything that could go wrong. All right, so here's our dermatomes, right? And so when you do this superficial or intermediate or deep cervical plexus block, which are the three ways to describe it, this is the area that's covered, not the greater occipital, but um, the, let me point it out. So the supraclavicular, the transverse cervical, the greater auricular, and the lesser occipital. So look at this area and any surgery in that region will be covered by the block. And here's our, our surgery, right? And so you can see that um, it matches pretty well, very well. All right, now this, um, when I was a resident, um, deep cervical plexus block was the regional block of choice for carotid surgery. And it was quite out of my reach. I didn't like the idea of hubbing a needle deep in the neck around the foramen and where the complications are, vertebral artery injection with seizure, intrathecal injection. You remember that the epineurium becomes the dura around the foramen. So if you got inside intraneural, you could have a, a total spinal, which was a disaster. And so I never liked the idea of a deep cervical plexus block. And that's why this is a real godsend for us because it's so easy and it's as efficacious as a deep cervical plexus block. So there are four deep cervical fascias in the neck. We have our investing fascia. So everyone look at this blue. This blue wraps around the sternocleidomastoid and it wraps around the trapezius muscle and it connects the two. This is called your investing fascia and this is what you're gonna pop through before you inject your intermediate cervical plexus block. So that's one of your four deep cervical fascias. The second is called the prevertebral fascia. Now all of you have put your needle through the prevertebral fascia because when we do an interscalene block, our needle comes posterior lateral to the probe. It goes through the middle scaling. And then you feel this huge pop when you leave the middle scaling and you enter the interscaling groove. That is the prevertebral, also known as the paravertebral fascia. So you've all put your needle through the prevertebral fascia. And so this prevertebral fascia wraps around and envelopes all the muscles in the posterior neck. All right, so we have our investing fascia and we have our prevertebral fascia. Then we have our carotid sheath, which wraps around our carotid vest. You've also put your needle through this when you've done your IJs. And then we have this visceral fascia or pretracheal fascia that wraps around the trachea, thyroid. And you might remember the Buck's fascia from medical school where you have an infection, it can spread down into the chest, blah, blah, blah. All right, so for this block, what I'm teaching you today is we will see our sternocleidomastoid muscle and we will see what's called the bird's beak, which is the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid our needle will pop through right under the skin. So we're gonna go through the skin, platysma, and we're gonna feel a pop. And that pop feels like if you took a needle and you put it through tin foil, that's the kind of pop you feel. It's a very definite pop loss of resistance, like a, like a ligamentum flavum. And we're gonna put our local into this space. Now, what is this space? The space is called the posterior cervical space, right? So where is your local going when you're injecting? We're gonna hold our probe over the sternocleidomastoid. We're gonna pop through the investing fascia and we're gonna inject into a potential space called the posterior cervical space. And I actually emailed this guy Stoneham in, in Great Britain who uh, wrote the trials on this to try to decide if that was what the space was. And he responded and said, yeah, I thought that was cool. So um, you can see these purple muscles. This is all prevertebral fascia. Our needle's going through the investing fascia, 
and putting the medicine in the posterior cervical space. But guess what? All this medicine is going to diffuse through the prevertebral fascia and make its way to the nerve roots as well as where the nerves exit. Remember all the nerves, the cervical plexus is all gonna exit in one location um, where the local will be. All right, so here's another representation of the four cervical fascias. We have our visceral, carotid, prevertebral, and investing fascias. Here's a dissection image from Netter showing the sternocleidomastoid, the superficial, the, I'm sorry, the cervical plexus emerging from under the sternocleidomastoid. And you can see the space between the investing fascia and the sternocleidomastoid is this posterior cervical space where our local is gonna go. All right, now let's say you aren't comfortable with ultrasound and you are put in a carotid room you can do what's called a superficial cervical plexus block. And it will be just as effective as an intermediate cervical plexus block and just as effective as a deep cervical plexus block. So we take a patient, we turn their chin up and out, and we draw a line along the sternocleidomastoid with a skin marker. Then we take a needle about yo long, and we hub it subcutaneously inferiorly and inject five cc's on the way out. Then we hub it superiorly along that line and we inject five cc's on the way out and you're done. That is called a superficial cervical plexus block. And you can do this in a heartbeat without ultrasound on the fly for any of the indications we talked about before where you would need this kind of coverage, meaning supraclavicular block, you know, like uh, clavicle surgery, earlobe surgery, um, anterior neck surgery. So the superficial cervical plexus block is the age old block where you basically subcutaneously infiltrate the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and you're done. I do this, but I also do the intermediate. So this is just my way of saying it's definitely gonna work. I'll do both because it's two seconds, it's easy, piece of cake. All right. So here are the three big authors in this literature, Pandit, Telford, Stoneham. They proposed this nomenclature because the intermediate, what used to be called the superficial, like if you read some of the first studies about intermediate, they refer to it as superficial. And so you'll see some confusion in the slides I'm about to show you where they refer to them interchangeably. But now the nomenclature is three blocks, superficial cervical plexus block, posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid intermediate cervical plexus block through the investing fascia, injecting local under the sternocleidomastoid in front of the prevertebral space, and three, deep cervical plexus block, which is feeling chastinix tubercle, drawing your dots, hitting the bone, doing basically a power vertebral block of the neck, which don't ever do, it's for historical purposes only. So look at this image. This is our intermediate cervical plexus block. It's popping through the investing fascia to put local in the posterior cervical space behind the sternocleidomastoid to get the cervical plexus. The superficial cervical plexus block, which is where we run the line of local along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, is sub Q, right? And sub Q is going to get all those nerves as they come out and get the same effect as if you got them when they were all bundled together. Look at my wrist and hand, right? Whether I block the nerves where my fingers are or where my wrists are, they're both gonna be effective. So my wrist would be intermediate and the, the subcutaneous would be superficial. So here's a cata uh, cadaveric dissection. This is the chin. This is the skin and platysma retracted away. This is the sternocleidomastoid. And look at these nerves. These are real meaty nerves coming out. Here's the... Um, uh, uh, zoomed in. So you see these with ultrasound. They're little hypoechoic circles and you can see them with ultrasound. You don't have to, but your best bet is to, all right, if you want to see the sternocleidomastoid, you have the patient push against your forehead, your hand with their forehead and that will bring out that muscle. If you want to bring out the scalenes, you have them sniff because this, 
the scalenes insert on the cervical spine to the first rib. And when you sniff, you bring out the scalenes. But in this case, we want to push against the uh, forehead against the hand to see the sternocleidomastoid. So you draw your line. C6 is your cricoid. And where your EJ crosses is about that spot too. So that is where you put your probe and that's where you start to look for these hypoechoic circles, which you don't have to see, but if you see them, it doesn't hurt. All right, I like making these kinds of slides because it shows probe position, ultrasound image, um, you know, representation if it was drawn out and what are we doing? So here's our patient position. All right, so we go in the room, bed's already turned, A line's in. Put the patient on the bed, your attending's throwing the monitors on while you prep the neck. Chlorhexidine prep, the whole neck. Timeout's done. Put the probe on and look for the bird's beak. And I said in the email yesterday, this is the easiest block we offer. <laughs> it's so simple, so extraordinarily simple. And that's such a godsend because it was so extraordinarily out of reach when I was a resident because we had to hub our needle to the vertebrae. But now what we're doing, now everyone recognize this view. This is your inner scaling block right here, right? We have our anterior scaling muscle, our middle scaling muscle, and the C5 and 6 roots. You know, when you do an inner scaling block, it's not C5, 6, 7. It's C5, 6, 6. Because it hasn't become the superior trunk yet. The roots, the C5, 6 roots are becoming the superior trunk at the inner scaling groove when we do our inner scaling block. And our needle would come through the skin, through the platysma, through the investing fascia, through the prevertebral fascia, we'd pop out of the middle scaling muscle into the interscaling groove and we put 15 mLs of local and that's our interscaling block. But in this case, we're gonna put our probe on and we're gonna look for the sternocleidomastoid, which I all want you all to do today when you're buying ultrasound is put the probe on your neck, your patient's neck and see the sternocleidomastoid. It's a giant muscle, you can't miss it. Its lateral board, border is described as the bird's beak. So this muscle is wrapped in the investing fascia and the investing fascia leaves the muscle, you see it along my mouse here, and it joins the trapezius muscle posteriorly. You're gonna pop through there. This is what your cervical plexus looks like on ultrasound. A bundle of nerves just posterior to the sternocleidomastoid's bird beak. So we put our probe here, our linear probe. So the probes we use are called linear. They have a footprint based on the size of the probe. So it can be number of millimeters. And they have a frequency range, eight to 12 megahertz. The higher frequency gives you the shallower look. So how do you change frequency on our sonocyte S nerve? Not by depth. The depth dial changes the frames per second, but the frequency is changed by clicking the button that goes from gen, pen, res. When you're on res, that's the higher frequency end of the probe. We have what's called a chip-based system, which means that you hit the power button, it turns on, versus GE, you hit the power button and, and Microsoft Windows has to load and there's a fan spinning and all this stuff. So we have a chip-based system, the Sonosite S nerve, which is basically a dumbed down ultrasound. It doesn't have pulse width Doppler and things like that. It's just there for us to do uh, the kinds of things we need it for. And uh, it's chip based, it's a linear probe, it's a high frequency probe, and the frequency is controlled by going to rest. So you always want your blocks because most of the stuff we do is superficial, you know, barring um, QL and things like that. You want it on res. So we put the probe right here. We see the bird's beak. Our needle comes in, in plane. This is called in plane. So you see the length of the needle on the screen versus out of plane where you just see a dot. So we come in plane through the skin, platysma, and then we'll feel a pop like we got an epidural. Poop. Then we'll aspirate and we'll do small aliquots, you know, five cc's at a time of injection and we'll see a potential space open up. We don't wanna see spread in the muscles. You'll get an inner scaling block. If you go through this fascia, you're gonna get a dead arm by the way. What do you see with the inner scaling block? Superior trunk loss, which is shoulder, bicep, and a numb thumb. That's C5 and 6. You don't want that. You want a neck that's numb. So our needle is going to go here, and we're going to see spread. And the spread is going to follow the prevertebral fascia and go medially. Now, you can advance your needle into that hydrodissection, but I really don't fish down here too much. 
because there's bad stuff down there. As you can see, the carotids here, um, stellate ganglions, you know, more inferior, but here's a nice view. The blue is the spread of the loco. All right. Intermediate cervical plexus. Excuse me one second. Okay. Um, the superficial cervical space communicates with the deep cervical space that may explain the efficacy of the superficial block. So this was work done by Pandit that showed that a superficial will spread down to the deep layers. So it's all permeable. Pandit and colleagues in their cadaveric study demonstrated that injections below the investing fascia of the neck diffuse into the deep space whereas injections placed subcutaneously did not. And so there was some controversy, but um, there was an Indian ink study, uh, this one that showed the, the deep spread. Um, and it's 15 ml, should be good. You know, um, and what should you use? Whatever, they're sensory nerves. You can use whatever you want. I personally take 15 mls of ropivacaine plane and I add five cc's of saline and that gives me a 0.375 mix, right? So sensory nerves should be covered by 0.12, but it was always thought that you wanted to get the strap muscles to be paralyzed. And so you might want some motor block, but again, the nerves of the anticervicalis are small and the quarter percent would probably work, but I personally choose 0.375%. So take a 20 ml syringe, 15 is ropivacaine 0.5, five is saline. That equals 0.375% plain ropivacaine. You could use lidocaine or mepivacaine, but they're only going to last, you know, 90 minutes or so. It, it depends. Um, and some of these surgeries can go on for longer, depending on the surgeon. All right, so here's our needle in plane. Came in laterally, popped through the investing fascia. It's posterior to the sternocleidomastoid, but it's in front of the prevertebral fascia and the middle and anterior scaly muscle. And the local is going to spread in this posterior cervical space, it's called. So this was a study looking at intermediate and superficial, and it found they were equally efficacious. So let's say you're with an attending who doesn't want to do the ultrasound. You just run a line of local along the posterior border, sternal cloud mastoid, and you're done. Start your case. But remember, you have to get them to an adequate plane of anesthesia, which is you need anxiolysis. So small titratable doses of midazolam. Maybe you'll give 25 of Benadryl to uh, acts as, um, you know, there's an FDA indication Benadryl for sedation and anxiety. So you give 25 of Benadryl, you know, rarely it can, it can be counterproductive because you can get some akathisia. If you push 50 of Benadryl every once in a while, you'll see a patient get kind of antsy, um, like the kid on an airplane who gets wild with Benadryl. So that's like an akathisia piece, but, you know, typically 12 and a half, 25 is going to help reduce, especially if you have an older person who you don't want to use too much of the disinhibiting midazolam, you might want to try a little bit of uh, diphenhydramine and then only give like 0.5 of, of, of Bursad. Now, remember, if someone's getting disinhibited, just stop the midazolam, stop the benzodiazepine once they start getting batty. Some people respond great to it. Like I said, you want their eyes closed, glabellar tap, they open. And then you want to push your Remy or your Presidex. So your Presidex, you can load with 0.5 to 1, and then you might run it at 0.3 and titrate up to 1. I'm just more comfortable with Remy fentanyl, so I use Remy fentanyl. So you start at 0 0.05, 0 0.075. I usually get to about 0.12. I see the respiratory rate's 8, and that's going to allow that retraction to not cause them to go, uh, 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 uh. if you don't have enough narcotic, even with a good block, they're going to start to get some ear pain. All right, and then for historical purposes, the, the deep cervical plexus block is a paravertebral block and you're getting the nerve root right as it exits the foramen. At, uh, after you feel chastinix tubercle, you draw the lines and hub it and you hit it and you hope you don't get the vertebral injection or a uh, total spinal. But historical importance only, don't do it. All right. So that's all that piece. So that's the regional piece. So patient selection, surgeon selection. If you know your surgeon takes five hours, don't do regional. <laughs> it's just, 
it's going to be a challenge. Um, it can be done. Now, in the, one of the biggest trials of general versus regional, the conversion rate from regional to general intra-op was 4%. So it's not a common thing once you do regional to have to convert to general. And that was a meta-analysis. But if the airway is challenging, you don't want to have an arteriotomy open with a shunt in place in an airway you can't get. So if the airway is not good, you may want to consider in a controlled setting getting the airway, you know, because you can topicalize and do them awake, whatever you need to do. But what you don't want is a patient who has cerebral ischemia intraop, who's seizing or whatever, who you can't get their airway. And so part of your decision to do a regional technique has to do with the airway because the plan B has to be able to be rapidly achieved. And again, if you do general, run Remy anyway, because they're not going to buck on the tube. You're going to turn the Remy down to point one at the end of the case, get them back breathing. And when they open their eyes, they won't be bucking on the tube, causing hematoma, because hematoma is a common thing. Inadequate reversal, whatever the patient's on aspirin, Plavix, preoperatively. So wake them up on Remy is a nice thing to do. All right, and even if you do general, you can run a line of local up and down the cervical plex, uh, posterior border of the sternal cladomastoid to give them postoperative analgesia as well. All right, so let's just do a couple pearls, like board uh, relevant pearls. I have about 45 minutes more lecture, but I don't think we're going to get there. Um, all right, so breweries, you listen to our brewery, only about half of the patients with hemodynamically significant stenosis have a brewery. So you can't say, oh, there's no brewery, we're good. Because first of all, if there's no flow, you're not going to hear a brewery. And half of the time, you won't hear a brewery. Now, when you do hear a brewery, only 35% have hemodynamically significant lesions. So it's not that specific or sensitive. Sensitive, it's, it might miss it. And specific, it doesn't mean what you think it means. And remember, left ventricular outflow murmurs also are heard in the carotid. So if you have subvalvular stenosis, valvular stenosis, or supravalvular, like a coarct, you're also going to hear carotid brewery. So you may want to assess for aortic stenosis, et cetera. <clears throat> One in 50 of the carotids you do will have a stroke. It doesn't mean it's your fault. And that's why you want to be well read on the case and do everything by the book. So if there is a stroke, you don't blame yourself. You say, you know what? This was a high risk situation and a bad outcome occurred. I did everything I could to prevent it. But that's why you want to be well read. That's why you want to study hard. That's why you want to be prepared. Because when there's a bad outcome, it takes away the guilt. Because you say, I knew everything about the case. I worked as hard as I could. I was prepared. I don't have to feel the guilt. But if I didn't check my machine and I have a, an anoxic brain injury, then I got to feel the guilt. <clears throat> and that's our whole vigilance piece. OK, hypertension. So the patient comes down. Their blood pressure is 220 over 130. Do you start the case? Well, poor outcomes have been shown when it's over 110, but there's two kinds of patients here. There's the asymptomatic carotid stenosis who came from the outpatient office. That case is canceled. We get him under control. Then there's the patient who's inpatient with a stroke who has an unstable plaque who needs this fix to prevent his, his risk at that time. That patient, you might maybe start some cardine, bring them down 20%, talk to the family about risk, talk to the surgeon about risk, and then make a decision. So it's not about an absolute number, it's about a situation. You wanna have drugs, two drugs on your pumps when you start the case. One is to bring the pressure up, and one is to bring the pressure down. Up is dopamine or norepinephrine or phenylephrine. Dopamine is going to make the heart rate high, and the number one determinant of myocardial oxygen consumption is heart rate. So I don't like dopamine. Norepinephrine or phenylephrine, both good choices. If the heart rate's already low, norepinephrine is better. So you put four in 250, you set it to four mics a minute, or you do phenylephrine. You guys all know how to use that. That's on one pump. The other pump is nicardipine, clevoprex, or nitroglycerin. Not a nitroprusside fan anymore, but clevoprex is your best bet. Nicardipine is just fine. So nicardipine comes in a bag, 200 milligrams. You start at five milligrams an hour, 50 cc's an hour, and you go up by 25 cc's an hour until a max of 15. I've never gotten above 10. 
So it's good because you don't want to give labetalol and commit for four hours. Because at the end of the case, when the plaque is gone and the carotid sinus is being hit, I'm sorry, the baroreceptors are being hit. So the plaque's out. Now that blood pressure is hitting that, you might have hypotension. So hypotension is common in recovery room because the, the um, baroreceptors are now seeing blood flow. And so usually right as you're leaving the room is when the pressure drops to 90 and the patient gets diaphoretic and you're in trouble if you don't turn on the phenylephrine or the levofed. And this has happened to me so many times that I wanna get this point across. You wanna have that on a pump ready to hit start. Because when the baroreceptors hit, you can have hypotension. Now, if the surgeon infiltrated when he was operating to prevent bradycardia, you may actually have hypertension in the PACU. And if it's more than 20% of baseline, you want to control that because you don't want hyperemia. Now that blood flow is going through the carotid, you can get vasogenic edema of the brain if the MAP is too high. All right, and that's, that's cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome. Hey guys, I'm gonna keep talking, but you're welcome to log off whenever you have to go to your cases. Um, I'm, I know I'm over, but some of you may have nothing to do, so you can keep listening. Otherwise, you can feel free to, to log off. Um, cerebral hypoperfusion syndrome, we just talked about. Increased cerebral blood flow post endarterectomy leads to transudation of fluid in the pericapillar astrocytes and interstitium. This results in vasogenic white matter edema. This can occur weeks later. But if you see a patient in recovery room become obtunded, that could be what's happening. But you also have to wonder, is there thrombus? Is there an intimal flap that, so you have the, the endothelium has an intima. And if blood flow gets under the intima, it causes an intimal flap, which can cause an acute change in mental status and pack you. And that would lead to patient needing to be brought back to the operating room. So any change in mental status in recovery room, the surgeon comes to the bedside and helps determine, is it hematoma? Is it nerve injury? Is it intimal flap? Is it hyperperfusion syndrome? If it's hyperperfusion syndrome, you wanna bring the pressure down. You wanna get maybe neurology involved. Maybe they give a little mannitol, hypertonic saline. There's different uh, ways to do it. All right, baroreceptors are commonly tested on the board. So let's talk about it. The carotid sinus baroreceptor, it's innervated by the sinus nerve of herring. It's in part of the ninth nerve and it synapses in the nucleus tractus solterius and the medulla modulates the activity of sympathetic versus parasympathetic activity. So a decrease in pressure causes decrease in firing up of this nerve. When you have decrease in firing to the medulla, you have different outflow of parasympathetic or sympathetic outflow. Um, I emailed you this presentation. So take a look at this, understand this, be able to spew it out quickly if it comes up on your boards. Surgeon's doing the case, all of a sudden you have bradycardia, heart rate's 20. What do you do? Well, you push atropine. If the heart rate drop isn't crazy, you might give half a milligram. If it's significant, you might give a milligram. If it doesn't respond, you start chest compressions and you call for transcutaneous pads. But usually it will respond to atropine or glyco and you'll be fine. At that time, the surgeon can infiltrate the area with local to prevent it from happening again. All right, let's say you do general and you wanna monitor the brain. How can you monitor the brain during general anesthetic? Well, the gold standard is considered awake patients. So you do regional technique, patients awake, you watch um, their cognition, the ability to squeeze a ball. But the other options are EEG. So EEG is surface electrodes that are looking for changes in the activity that might be associated with ischemia. The problem is it's, only the area you're looking at that. So if it's a deep cortical brain, I'm sorry, if it's a deep brainstem issue, it's not going to show up on your surface EEG, but it is frequently used and we don't really need to understand how to read it, but there'll be a, a neurophysiologist there to monitor it. And so let's say the surgeon clamps, there's changes. It will make it put a shunt. There's still changes. You may drive your blood pressure up. There's still changes. The surgeon may decide to abort or continue. And that's the problem with these monitorings. You have to know how you're going to react. So if you do cerebral oximity and you see a drop, you have to show what you did in your record, right? So there's a perioperative stroke. You are named in a lawsuit. They say, doctor, you chose to use cerebral oximity. 
there was a 30% drop. What did you do? Well, it has to be shown in your notes, in your, in your chart, surgeon alerted, mean arterial blood pressure increased, shunt placed, surgeon decided to proceed. We also have transcutaneous Doppler. That's where you're looking for um, flow in the circle of Willis. Stump pressure means they measure, so you have blood coming up the uh, contralateral carotid. It comes across the circle of Willis. It comes back down to the carotid on the ipsilateral side. If you give the surgeon a transducer and they measure up there, that tells you how much backflow there is and that there's good collateral flow. The surgeon can also visually see this when they see the back bleeding. Um, kind of lost favor, but it's, it's important to know about. We are super aware and super familiar with SCCP monitoring, right? We do it for all of our spines. And so we can monitor cortically. We can also do um, subcortical monitoring or brainstem monitoring with SSCP. So that's also an option. And jugular venous oxygenation is, is the last one. Um, so these are, uh, you can read more about them, but each one has its pitfalls and benefits. And um, ideally an awake patient gives you the most information. Using a shunt doesn't go without risk because you can cause emboli, you can cause an intimal dissection, and it blocks the surgeon's view. But shunting is pretty universal at this point. All right, hypotension. We talked about this. Um, remember that hypotension, you know, is going to prevent, is going to decrease coronary perfusion. Your 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 left, um, your aortic diastolic pressure minus your left ventricular end diastolic pressure is your coronary perfusion pressure. So if you have hypotension you, and you have a obstructive flow, you could have ischemia. And there's a very high risk of myocardial ischemia perioperatively with carotid end arterectomy. And so we want to always keep them where they live. Remember, patient didn't have a heart attack yesterday. So if they have one today, it's because of something that we changed. So you want to keep them where they live. So you look back at their primary visit and say, okay, their baseline's 150. I want to stay 30% of that systolic of 150 because that's what they're used to. Remember, it's autoregulation in the brain and the heart is between a mean of 50 and 150. So between means of 50 and 150, the blood flow stays the same. But if they're normally have a hypertension, it may be 70 to 170. So if you allow them to be 50, they actually will have ischemia. Remember, as blood flow decreases to a tissue, you, eventually, you, you, uh, you approach the ischemic prenumbra, right? Which is a number where when you decrease blood flow to my brain, I may start to get this arthric, but the cell hasn't died yet. I just can't keep up with the metabolic functions. I'm sorry, the uh, neurotransmitters, the, the firing of the nerves. I can't keep up with that with energy. I mean, there's no glucose reserves in the brain. So it's very dependent on blood flow. So if you um, decrease blood flow, I may start to slur my speech, but until I can't maintain cellular integrity, which is at the ischemic prenumber, the cell hasn't died. So I haven't had a stroke yet. So our goal is to maintain that mean 30% of where you live. All right, carotid body, right? So we have our medulla, which has chemoreceptors, which measures CSF pH to mostly control our ventilation. So even if our carotid bodies are denervated bilaterally, we're still gonna hyperventilate based on our CO2. But if you chronically have CO2 elevation, your kidneys will retain bicarbonate and your pH will be normal and you will lose your CO2 drive. So if you had bilateral carotid surgery, you may not have that hypoxic drive for respiration. So we wanna be careful with patients with opioids and things because they may not have the drive to breathe if they have denervation of the carotid body.
okay? And that's versus the carotid sinus, which is our baroreceptors, which control blood pressure. Now the cranial nerve dysfunction, dysfunction piece is generally short lived, um, but you can see dysphagia, hoarseness from the recurrent laryngeal injury, and you can have hypoglossal injury. But again, in six weeks, it usually comes back. All right, cool. I went over, but I got some of you guys stayed. Uh, let me see if there's any questions. You can unmute and ask questions, or you can um, use the uh, chat section. Great lecture, dude. Thank you. Um, yeah, that worked out. We'll make sure that they know you, you saying you're you're emailing the slides. Yeah, I sent it already to the residents. Yeah. Okay, and the entire thing is recorded and will be on. Thursdays and you like now YouTube our channel YouTube, or something? yeah yep I'll put it on our YouTube channel okay and let us know how to access that because I have no idea okay <laughs> but we'll figure it you know out know where I it do. is it's where your um your video is to the new applicants okay the folder there called lectures and so far I have upper extremity and lower extremity regional on there so this and now we have carotid third one yeah many awesome thank many you dude. all right Thanks. All right. Have, have a great have day. A great day. Be safe. You too.